meeting is being recorded. Thanks. Welcome, everyone, um, to another session of System Thinking Ontario. Uh, we're honored today to uh, have a book launch for the open access version of the Ecological Limits De of Development, Living with the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and uh, there's no excuse for anyone to not get this book because you can go to the internet and you can download it. Uh, just on your screen, I've got uh, the cover and the, um, I, I, I actually read the book in one go on Saturday. And this is the one diagram I thought, oh, if I had to summarize the whole book in one diagram, this is it. Um, yeah. But we'll see what uh, people have to say about that. Um, we're going to have a little bit of change in format from the usual uh, System Thinking Ontario, because normally we have a, a go around that takes 10, 15 minutes where everyone introduces themselves. I'm going to pause and ask everyone to type in um, onto their chat instead. Uh, and if you would chat, uh, put in your name, uh, where are you located, and uh, how much you know about the SDGs? Um, because if uh, that'll, that'll help set the uh, the stage for um, for the uh, speakers that will come. Well, we'll have all that parallel typing. Uh, I'll tell you about how we're going to uh, run this session. Uh, we're actually going to do this in two passes. Um, on the first pass, uh, we're going to have uh, Katie uh, lead the session, um, introduce the speakers, and uh, each one of them will have, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, however long they need to cover whatever ideas they want to do. Uh, I would encourage everyone to enter their comments and their questions into the chat. Um, I've kind of told Katie that she doesn't have to pay attention to the chat or the other speakers. What I'll be doing afterwards on the second pass is then coming back at the beginning, scrolling up to the top and bringing people back to the discussion points that you've had. So uh, that theoretically means that we're going to start off with some basics, introductions, get deeper and deeper, and then uh, we'll close out the presentation section. We'll come back in the second pass and uh, we'll then... Um, uh, start hopefully with the easier questions and uh, work our ways through. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to hand it over to Katie, who I assume may have uh, control over some uh, video. Uh, let's see. Katie? Hi. I don't have a screen to share. Uh, I thought that I would just go with my lovely face. I think my colleagues have some screens to share. So I get I get screen share fatigue. So um, thank you all for coming. And thank you so much to David for hosting us. This group regularly has some of the most interesting discussions on things. So I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and yeah, why are we here? We're here to talk about our book, The Ecological Limits to Development, which was published mid last year and very recently announced to be going open access, which was a really huge thing for us as it really parallels with some of the arguments that we make throughout the book. Um, my name is Katie Kish. I'm a research associate at York University with the Ecological Footprint Initiative, where I've worked for the last two years. And before that, I did my PhD at Waterloo, and that's where I still live in Waterloo. Uh, and this book really emerged from my academic mentorship during my PhD with Steve, who was my supervisor. And I remember once uh, that he and I were sitting in a truck and we were drinking coffee and we're sitting there talking about some of the ideas that are in this book. And he said, oh, this could be a book. And I said, can you imagine that us writing a book? And we both just burst out laughing at this thought like, oh, ha, 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 yeah, Kish and Quilly, wouldn't that be hilarious? Uh, we just laughed at the impossibility of him and I being able to gather our ideas in enough of a way that it would come together into something. And later I thought, I mean, why not? Um, it turned out there were a lot of reasons for the why not, but we did it anyway. And it was a really enjoyable process to parse through our differences, which there are many, and to find a way to represent a number of different worldviews within this one conversation. 
And there are so many topics in here. So there were some places that we didn't really think we could uh, deal with the ideas with any great deal of accuracy. So we invited some of our friends and colleagues to help us bridge, bridge those gaps. And I've invited two of them here with us today. Uh, the book is organized by starting with theoretical underpinnings that are required to make the arguments that we do throughout the rest of the book, which is then separated out by subjects related to the SDGs. And then each chapter relates that theory from the beginning to the SDG topics. And then we suggest what different kinds of goals could be added to the SDGs to make them more ecological. Okay. We focused on the SDGs, not because we think they're particularly great or anything, but just because they are really well used, um, really like highly adopted across the world. Um, but what we really do is we highlight and recognize that the SDGs were developed within this pattern of life that emerged in the post-industrial revolution. And we really focus in on individualism. Uh, and that emphasis on individualism is actually is really interesting because it speaks to like a core value that's increasingly um, emphasized among people of different viewpoints and different politics. Uh, and that is that there's this emphasis for community and family and connection and conviviality and local production and meaningful education. These are things that are, are seeming to be less and less um, left or right centered. These are things that people in general uh, are starting to recognize as important. But the SDGs were all created within like a common sense and a system that intentionally removes community and family and connection and conviviality, et cetera, all towards transactions and towards growth. So every area of life that the world sees as successful development in these goals is based on that common sense. And so then we, we try to question that in the book. So what I like about that approach is that we end up with like a lot of positive approaches uh, that might have more indirect relationships with reduced consumption or with uh, ecological sustainability. So not saying directly, you know, consume less as a goal, like you should, people, the, the numbers of consumption should go down or production should go down, but instead saying spend more time with family and friends, which has, you know, it's a bit more roundabout, but there's there's evidence that shows that will reduce your consumption in the long term, in the long run, because there's different ways of fulfilling your happiness instead of through consumption. So we really tried to look at things that we could grow, uh, not to say don't do this, but hey, do this. So I'll just really quickly, my favorite, my favorite chapter, my favorite example is the sustainable development goal number four, which is education. So the UN indicators, so each for those who aren't familiar with the SDGs, there's a overarching goal, and then there's a series of indicators that they list in order to meet that goal. So the education one, the indicators relate to universal numeracy, literacy, uh, equitable access to high quality and primary secondary education systems, the sorts of things that you would, might expect. And a quick caveat, which we say in the book at least, at least twice, we don't disagree that there should be equitable access to high quality primary and secondary education. We think that is a good thing um, and that the SDGs that do exist are mo most for the most part good. We just some have some other ideas. So those those indicators reflect the commitment to an idea of an individual who needs to engage with institutions, uh, institutions of the state and of civil society and of the market economy as an educated individual. So they're an education system. So they're educated within a system that replaced informal and community processes of learning with state defined and standardized approaches to education that train individuals to be members of a state rather than members of their community. So the relationship between modernizing education systems designed to, was really designed to create these able individual citizens and workers and it drives and depends on growth. And so the goal produced by the UN doesn't do anything to challenge that underpinning. And that's where all of our comments really come from. It's not that these aren't good things. It's not that we haven't progressed in this really, in really good, in really good ways uh, of having high quality education. It's that the way that the emphasis that we have put on education, was it the right spin to have an ecological future? Or are these emphasis on educations really just steeped in 
material growth and growth economics. So we ask what other kinds of education indicators can we see that link both social and ecological limits? What can we grow that will result in less consum consumption? What can our development be that will have less consumption and have a more ecological uh, outcome? So instead of just counting the number of say girls that receive education, which is one of the indicators, which again, it is important, but what about measuring um, how often tacit and hands-on education is utilized? Or how well does an education, a country's education system support cognitive justice or complex thinking for future world problems? How often is complex thinking taught in, in elementary school? Um, so that's where we come from. So Steve is going to introduce a bit more on the theoretical aspects of the book. And then that'll be followed by Sophia Sanidi and Katie Guizdon, who have chapters in their book, and they'll talk about them. I'll let them each introduce themselves um, because they'll do a better job of introducing themselves and they have interesting things to say. So for now, I'll pass it to Steve and then we'll hear from Sophie and Katie after that. Uh, thank you, Katie. Well, I'm Steve, Steve Quilly. Um, I'm a prof at University of Waterloo. And um, so the book. Um, during I, I did my PhD in um, uh, when was it nine the mid nineties so I remember during when I was doing it um, and we were quite the the narrative about climate change was kind of hotting up um, we got very concerned for a couple of years about the red lights on the videos on the TVs on the remotes and there was a whole thing about turning off and they would remind you on the tv to turn off the remotes and everyone knew it was kind of nonsense um but it was a way of kind of telling yourself that you cared about the environment and you try and um turn off the remote but 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 we were all aware that our lives were completely embedded in this sort of structure of consumption from which you couldn't really get out of so um and over the next 20 uh, years um, each generation became more au fait with climate change, more au fait with uh, um, the, 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 the great extinction, the biodiversity crisis, pollution, the coral reefs. Um, and um, they became more educated, and yet their ecological footprint carried on rising um, in ways that they couldn't really control. And actually, when you point that out to first years, um, they're perpetually surprised um they don't kind of believe you that their their ecological footprints are higher um than the, the generation 10 years before and yet they are um one of the insights one of the the sort of points of departure for this book for me was the work of hg odom who um was a, a kind of systems ecologist really and he looked at um energy flows and transformations um, through ecosystems and and he came up with this concept of it was a theorization of embedded energy so rather than just looking at the energy which you'd find locked up in a in, in a commodity like this pen you'd look at all the transformations along the the um the, the right from the, the the point at which solar energy is hitting the earth um all the transformations which uh, are necessary in order to produce the materials and put together the final product and the the takeaway from that was that um, the greater the complexity of a system, the greater the complexity of a, a set of artifacts, the more energy, that's unsurprising, but also um, that that um, intangible things have an energy footprint. So ideas can have a, um, a, a an energy signature. And so the idea of human rights is a very, very high energy concept. It only makes sense. It's only possible in a uh, complex society of individuals, which has gone through this kind of essentially through a process of capitalist modernization. Um, and so that starts to engender some real paradoxes that the liberal world that we live in um, is, is uh, energy dependent and resource dependent in ways which are not necessarily tractable to the kind of um, the kind of uh, policy instruments that, that are generally uh, used in the field of sustainable development. Um, over the last 200 years, well, 150 years, the, the, the politics in the West and increasingly in, in parts of the global South have been organized on this left-right spectrum, so uh, which broadly corresponds to um, the, the market versus the state, the more market on the right, the more state on, on the left. And we're, we're mesmerized by that political difference and by that tension between the market and the state. Um, and what we forget when when we when we when we think in terms of that um 
that spectrum is that both the market and the state emerged together. You're, be you're better really talking about the state market, which was the product of, of, uh, of the process of modernization. And the state market depends on an atomized society of spatially and socially mobile individuals. So modernity is the first society in which someone can ask sensibly, who am I and what can I become? They're questions that we take for granted when you have a kid you know the first thing you start asking them or granny starts asking them when they're three or four and can understand is what do you want to be when you grow up that question wouldn't make sense in any other um society um and what that's indicative of is a high degree of disembeddedness and mobility and individualization and and uh, the decline of ascriptive social identities which come from just you know the location social gender whatever it is in, into which you're born um so if, if we present that as being atomized it sounds negative but uh the, you know an atomized society but it's also the very same condition which makes it possible to think about rights which makes it possible to think about democracy or equality under the law all of those kind of things um so ht odom um, complexity and energy, a sociology of modernization. And then the, the other point of departure is Karl Polanyi. Polanyi looks at this process of disembedding. And um, for him, the contrast is between the state market and something called livelihood. Livelihood is the kind of society of the communitarian, ascriptive, place bound society of families and households, which operates on the basis of re reciprocation and covenant rather than transactions. Um, and livelihood has become very diminished. It's almost a definition of um, modernization of, of uh, modernity is the uh, diminution of, uh, of livelihood. Um, and so we're in this kind of paradoxical process of modernization. We take for granted the state, we take for granted um, the market, we take for granted um, a society of highly mobile individuals and then we project it as a as a as a condition of uh as a as a non-negotiable condition for development um all over the global south and wherever kind of large institutions start wielding their uh, their their sets of incentives and their economic power and for very good reasons, you know, if we start educating women or or trying to, you know, produce democratic systems, democratic systems don't really work in 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 clan based, family based, tribal communities. So, you know, there's, there are good political reasons for wanting this society of individuals, and yet that society is a very high um, uh, footprint in terms of energy, in terms of resources, in terms of land, in terms of the impact on biodiversity and all the rest. And when you start looking into it, um, uh, the, 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 we we used Rockstrom's um, the the study from Sweden quite a lot. When you start looking into it, it becomes very very clear that if um, if all of the sustainable development goals were met, um, almost by definition, as nightfall as day, um, many of the operating parameters for a sustainable biosphere would be breached very very quickly in in short order. So there's a real tension between the sustainable development goals and um, in terms of their development and um, sustainability, which is in a sense is just this, the same argument between limits to growth um, on the one hand and sustainable development on the other. It's a rehash of that argument from, from the uh, 1970s. And I suppose that uh, Katie and I at least are starting from a kind of uh, 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 the idea that um, limits to, biophysical limits to growth are real. And the ecological economic premise that that um, that metabolic scale has to trump um, both efficiency and social justice. You can put social justice before efficiency before you start using the markets, but 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 um, biophysical scale has to trump everything. Um, that's the sort of founding premise of kind of Herman Daly's ecological economics. Um, if you take that seriously, then you start to answer. You, you start to you ask, well, what what would um, sustainable what would development goals look like if they they took into account if they um were predicated on uh scale uh, and biophysical limits and if um the state and the market um took a slightly less um pivotal role and you started to increase the domain of livelihood so all i want to do uh, and that's essentially what the book's about is how, how would you uh set a sort of how would you create a kind of version of modernization which um 
which ent entailed much greater space for uh, families, for communities, for place-bound relationships. Um, and how would you deal with the kind of the wicked dilemmas that that kind of society is more restrictive, it's, it has less, uh, not, not no choice, but certainly it's associated with less choice, less mobility, and um, is less oriented, oriented towards the individual. And so ju just to end with, I'll just give an example of how, two examples of how that might work. Have I got time for two examples, Katie? Short ones? Well, you have one example. You have time for one, one example. example. Yeah. You are severe. Okay, one example. Um, uh, I think, I can't remember if Catherine mentions it in her, uh, Catherine Zywert, who was also doing a PhD at the same time on, on um, health in the Anthropocene, what this kind of paradigm might mean for the delivery of health. And one of the examples that um, she, she looked at was that of Giel in Belgium which is a, a, a town where 900 years ago, there was a saint, a princess was martyred, um, burnt at the stake, I think, um, Dibna from Ireland. And um, they felt very bad about it, which was <laughs> unusual for the time. And uh, they did the only thing they could do, which was make her a saint. And then um, what followed for the next 900 years was that um, in order to sort of, um, I suppose, a penance for the bad deed of the town, um, people with very, very severe uh, mental Ill, men, mental problems, mental illness would would come and, and would live with families, often for life. Um, and people with schizophrenia, I mean, they didn't they, they understood it in a very different way in those days. The amazing thing about this is that it's still going. There are still this town. There are still thousands of uh, people with very, very severe mental health problems who are living for um for years sometimes decades and often for their whole lives with the families of complete strangers who take them in it's it's framed within the kind of a, a, a catholic um you know uh, ontology that that's why they're doing it they, they're sort of devout catholics and um the astonishing thing about it is that when the state came in that they didn't just abolish it what they did was they said oh well we have a, a rare orchid here um it's something that um, we don't want to destroy. So what they did is instead of just uh, kicking, you know, developing a great big mental health service and a modern system with a hospital and you know, and all the, and, and professional nurses and all the rest of it, they built a bathhouse and they just said, listen, if if you uh, um, keep this arrangement going, and they helped out with a little bit of respite when the families needed, um, you know, a bit of a hand or things were getting too much, or if someone was having a problem, and that and the, the, they went for a bath. Uh, in a sauna once a week, uh, once every couple of weeks, and the mental health nurses who ran the sauna could just see if that if thing, things were going off the rails and just keep an eye on things. But otherwise, they left this thousand-year-old relationship set of arrangements going. Now, the important thing about that from um, from our theoretical point of view is that that's an example of a covenant. It's it's people entering into a relationship which is potentially lifelong, you know, kind of like a marriage or something, or, or like having having children or a relative living use so it's it's covenantal and not transactional it's um uh it's not regulated by the state in the same way it's not uh for money it's not trans and it's very cheap financially which is obviously part of the reason why the state kind of uh likes it um but it's also very low cost in energy terms you're not having to build expensive new buildings you're not having to have training centers to train the nurses you're not having this whole swathes of kind of social complexity which go with the modern mental health system which are are, are simply stripped out of that system um but however good it is it would be almost impossible to start it from scratch um if you imagine even trying to run a football team um the 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 uh the um uh for, for sorry my kids are coming in to the out with the cat sorry um, um if you try and set up any of these systems in, in a modern in, in, in any kind of modern uh, society, you're immediately involved training and complexity and DEI and more training and universities and uh, police checks and all the rest of it. So it becomes very, very uh, complicated. And so so the, 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 I suppose the takeaway is if you want to if, if you want to set up, if you want to achieve the kind of levels of care and the levels of satisfaction and the levels of um, uh, uh, the standards of living in a low or no growth economy or an economy which is even contracting, 
then um, you, there are ways in which you can do things very, very cheaply from an ecological point of view. There are ways in which you can reduce what uh, H.G. Odom calls the transformity, the energy signature associated with certain goods and services. Um, but you, you will produce a society that's more covenantal, more ascriptive, in, so, in many ways more nurturing, more enjoyable, more um, probably people will be happier in some ways, but with significantly less choice and less mobility and um, real sacrifices in terms of the, the capacities of the state to kind of oversee and ensure standards or equality or, or any of these things. Um, and there are many, many more examples which um, we can get into in the discussion. Thank you very much. And I didn't say thank you, David, for, for having us as well. Um, it's uh, great to be here. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so we'll go to Sophie next. I believe she's here. Thanks, she Katie. <clears throat> I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint. Everyone can see that okay? Yes. Amazing. So thanks folks for having me. My name is Sophia Sanidi. Thank you, first of all, to the organizers of this event, as well, of course, to Katie and Steve for putting this book together. Um, I am on Rome, Italy internet, which means that on occasion it cuts out. So I do apologize. I'll try to talk uh, calmly and slowly. And if I do cut out, please feel free to ask me to repeat myself. Happy to do that. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of both myself and my co-author, Sarah Louise Ruder. Um, Sarah Louise is completing a PhD right now at the University of British Columbia in uh, the intersections of technology and agriculture. I have just completed my PhD uh, and an emerging uh, ecological economics scholar in the area of degrowth and the pandemic or broadly more uh, adapting to emergency circumstances as we will see more of in the future of our changing climate. So uh, myself, I have been part of the Society of uh, the Canadian Society for Ecological Economics since 2015. I joined the board in 2017, and that is largely what this presentation will be about today. So um, I'll be presenting on the chapter that Sarah Louise and I wrote together which is a living case study of a conference, which as we uh, put here in the hashtag, we tried to organize a little bit differently. So academics hold a privileged position in society. We have access to important knowledge and research as well as power that is often limited within the walls of the ivory tower. It shapes what knowledge is trusted, whose voices are respected, and what policy decisions are. A revolution, economic and social culture is necessary to meet the challenges of climate change. It becomes essential to offer alternative ways of creating and exchanging knowledge. So the chapter that Sarah Louise and I wrote together present a living case study of unconferencing, a gathering that was organized by academics with the explicit purpose of creatively disrupting traditional power structures that pervade the academic institution. And we present the approach and the implementation and the outcomes of the 2019 Conference of the Canadian Society for Ecological Economics entitled Engaging Economies of Change. The chapter is written in conversation with two sustainable development goals, number 13, climate action, and number 17, partnership for the goals, and building on the ecological economic critiques of the goals presented in the other chapters. And again, congrat congratulations to all uh, co-authors of this book. This was a fantastic um, project that we were able to pull together. So most importantly, Sarah Louise and I foregrounded equity as well as intersectional feminism to reimagine in what climate action and partnership could enact based on an event aimed to exemplify the very alternative economics that our membership claims to celebrate. So first of all, who is CANSI? The Canadian Society for Ecological Economics is a national network of scholars and practitioners that promote education, research, and policy recommendations. 
We have held biennial conferences across Canada for the last three decades. And a quick plug that we are hosting our 14th biennial Can't See conference this upcoming October 2023 at York University, accessible for most GTA folks. So in 2019, we held our 12th biennial conference in Waterloo, Ontario. And for the first time, students were put in charge. And we immediately opted for a radical rethinking of historical conference approaches. So why is a conference important for the SDGs? Well, let's start with looking at SDG number 13, climate action, taking urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. First, we need to ask, uh, urgent for whom? Notions of urgency can risk silencing and further perpetuating existing systems of injustice at the sacrifice of consent, of trust, and of accountability. Urgency may also only be accessible to the regions with resource abundance and more democratic governance structures. This goal also fails to identify who specifically should be acting, as we know those who contributed the least to the problem are experiencing the greatest impacts. Sophie, so you as broke an up. example, limiting global warming. Yep, I'm so sorry. Just Where did I break up? Well, it was an important, those who contribute the least mm -hmm. to the problem are experiencing the greatest impacts. Thank you, Katie. So as one example, if we think about limiting global warming to two degrees Celsius, this is considered a tolerable compromise that conveniently favors a hospitable climate for industrialized nations. We know that two degrees uh, at this scale will disappear many small scale, uh, small island states and impose irreversible changes to weather, growing seasons and infrastructure for many communities and ecosystems around the world. So when we are thinking about action, what actions are we considering and for whom? SDG number 17 called Partnership for the Goals focuses on strengthening the means of implementation and revitalizing the global partnership for sustainable development, focusing on coordinated governance approaches. Indeed, in this uh, chapter, Sarah Louise and I argue that we must go beyond traditional international agreements, such as the Paris Agreement, for example, which is not enforceable, and highlight the interactions between goals and the importance of solidarity. And here we can acknowledge this is a, a picture from Cancy 2019. This is actually Katie herself presenting as a keynote with her baby strapped to her front. And it was quite a uh, impeccable scene to see a mother in arms doing academy and child rearing at the exact same time. So we must acknowledge in particular power imbalances between parties and work explicitly towards anti-oppression, decolonization, and re reconciliation. And more than that, ensure that our partners and our allies are equipped with the tools, knowledge, and capacities needed and actively remove barriers to participation. So engaging economies of change was the product of generous partnership and solidarity across movements to center ecological and equity considerations in convening an exchange of ideas and amplifying actions on climate through meaningful and inclusive dialogue. So let's dig in. So in terms of innovating the academic conference and conversation, there's a few steps that we followed. The first was building relationships doing our homework around anti-oppressive event planning, and through the spirit of reciprocity, we ensured that participants, um, that we participated in partner events to demonstrate our solidarity and to build trust. So, so partnered with organization, we didn't just ask them to show up for us, we also made sure to show up for them. Community guidelines, um, through deep thinking and listening about what is assumed and through the honest conversations that are needed for the kinds of societal change we want, we must foreground accountability, reflexivity, and respect. So we asked participants to contribute in their registration form a set of community guidelines to hold each other accountable through these tough conversations. We also redistributed power 
by providing a sliding scale for registration fees, free registration for Indigenous identified participants, gender inclusive washrooms, the listing of pronouns on name tags, and one that I'm most proud of was free childcare services to anyone attending the conference that needed it. To alleviate the burden of labor often placed on women, limiting the female voice in the academy and in research and policy priorities more broadly. We also chose to live our values. So from an ecological economics perspective, sustainability involves the full spectrum of relationships and inter interactions between society, human society, the local economy, and ecosystems. Integrating this directly into event management processes can see 2019 organizers prioritize supporting the local economy, minimizing environmental harm and maximizing community impact. And here's a scene from one of the presentations, which was actually a student doing some research on local craft beer breweries and how they support the local economy. So we identified various partners that reflected these values and coordinated eight different local food and beverage vendors to offer a completely vegetarian menu for the conference, including an Anishinaab, a, tr a traditional Anishinaabe feast. We rented uh, local equipment as well as printing services that were provided by local businesses and kept the financial impact circulating locally. And we saved about 2.5 tons of greenhouse gas emissions through waste management and food choices. We also invited our keynotes to participate remotely if they wanted to, to reduce their ecological impact. And in 2019, this was actually still a pretty novel idea, pre-pandemic. We also added chairs to the table. Student empowerment, such as hiring musicians, graphic artists, and event managers who were students in training, were able to participate in our conference event management through paid services. We also provided free educational workshops and training services that were student oriented, as well as following up on our biennial student symposium, where we train our students to prepare for our conferences. We also ensured public participation. A public lecture family friendly maker night in which we partnered with our local library and the local maker communities as well as a public mural painting in the town square to collaborate and discuss community priorities. We also had members of the government participate including a local mayor and the Green Party of Canada which grounded the conference in everyday matters that impact the public. So what are the lessons learned? This is a graphic directly from the chapter which shows a flow of the different sort of initiatives around our conference and their impact. We've been exploring alternative pathways that are not easy, but absolutely necessary to create the change we hope to see in the world. It's important to start local and with your own community, especially your own discipline. You might be surprised to find resistance there. We must break down barriers that keep researchers exclusive and extractive and extend invitations of meaningful engagement to more non-traditional conference attendees. This case study serves to think through climate action and partnership initiatives grounded in a commitment for justice and sustainability as they build towards an ecological economic future. So we conclude with a couple of suggestions for SDGs. The first, uh, number 13, around climate action, so it should emphasize intersectional climate justice. We could include supporting and amplifying existing community-based movements, redistributing resources to support these efforts, and make space for local and Indigenous knowledges to participate in achieving our targets. Goal 17, partnership for the goals, could be reconfigured to address solidarity and collaboration across the goals, and establish harmony with diverse actors through partnerships that acknowledge and correct the power balance of imbalances between parties. The targets could, man could, under this mandate, address the implications of each SDG to identify where one goal might compromise another or work at the expense of a particular group. Ensuring partners are equipped with the tools, knowledge, and capacities needed would also be essential to, re to remove barriers to participation. While this approach was applied to a conference context, it should not be limited to only this. 
all work must prioritize accountable relationships, consent, and sovereignty. We hope our efforts raise expectations everywhere and that our outcomes, um, I, I refer all of you to explore our outcomes further in a published uh, magazine issue that I will link in the chat as well. And happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Sophie. We'll pass it over to Katie for the final presentation before we get into discussion. Hello, I'm the other Katie, Katie with Y. <laughs> Not nearly as important as the Katie with the IE, but I'm so happy to be here. And I'm so happy also to follow Sophia. Um, I was actually recently invited to contribute a chapter for a book on ecofeminism economics. Uh, and decolonization in the MENA region, so Middle East, North Africa. So all kinds of amazing is happening just with that book idea. Um, and in my first act, because they wanted it to be on one of my local human, human rights-based projects, local community projects that I do, was to invite the local leader as a co-author. You know, I was approached as an academic because that's the legitimacy of our world. but. Why is, my, why is that more legitimate than her experiential value leadership that should be more legitimate than me and my degrees? So uh, we, it's little things like that that we have to acknowledge in our, in our own work. So I was very happy to follow you. I loved what you had to say. So. Okay, a little bit about me. I will send it to you. <laughs> uh, I am the executive director of the Center for Environmental Ethics and Law. It's an international NGO based here in Washington, DC. I also teach human rights law, uh, humanitarian law, or the law of war, uh, climate change law. And for the first time at my university, uh, the decolonization of international law, which is a big deal for a US law school to do that. And I teach for uh, Northern Illinois University just outside Chicago. I saw somebody is uh, from Chicago. So I'm also a founding member of the Ecological Law and Governance Association, which is how Katie and I met. I am the chair of the ethics specialist group for the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, IUCN is the world's oldest and largest uh, international environmental organizations where states are member parties. It's a 1948 organization, has a lot of issues, a lot of important jobs for an ethics, an ethics advocate. Uh, and I'm also an expert for the UN Harmony with Nature program. So I work explicitly with the SDGs and how to make them not fail, basically. So I was, it was a real honor to be asked to be part of this book. Uh, thank you, Katie, for inviting me to contribute a chapter. Thank you to Katie and Stephen for having the idea for this space and for this publication. Um, and thank you also to David and the organization for today. Having open access is also a decolonization act. <laughs> it's intentionally so. The freedom and access to information uh, matters for equality and equity. So, okay, so now what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, the chapter, so my chapter is a crisis of identity, the UN uh, SDGs within an, within an unsustainable law and governance framework. Uh, the chapter begins on a very happy note by acknowledging that all of the SDGs are failing. Um, this is not my opinion they are all failing. And as you saw in the resolution I linked, uh, this is from 2015. They're already talking about the now beyond 2030. Uh, so they're failing and they're not moving up. So I think this is a prime opportunity to talk about why they're failing and how not to repeat the mistakes of, of why, you know, of why they're failing. So, so acknowledges all the SDGs are failing and gives a critical analysis as to why, looking at the state of the system within which these goals are placed, um, how they were drafted first, and second, um, yeah, how they were drafted first and also how they're expected to succeed within that space, arguing that the nations which finalized, adopted, or governed the final text, because within the UN, it's state negotiations. And within state negotiations, there are more powerful states than others. You have some states that are more powerful than the, the collection of 130 states of the, G, of the G77. So there are, there are a lot of issues of inequity within the negotiation process itself and justice. 
But I argue that the nations which finalized, adopted, or governed the final text were naive at best and complicit at worst in their failure. So in other words, I look at the soil in which the seeds of the SDG were planted, as well as those who created or genetically modified, if we want to play on words, those seeds. And otherwise, in other words, why development? Why did we take a development approach for a path for sustainability? So here we have a critique of not just global environmental governance, but global governance, i.e. state power, negotiations, et cetera, as well as the, de the, the developmental approach of the SDG model. I argue that the SDGs are in an identity crisis, not only in their conflicting goals due largely to the community originated drafting, but the state concluded redrafting negotiation and adoptions. So it began with a very local effort, but by the time it got to the document that was put before the states to vote on, where were the words and the, where was the origin story? Where, were, where was the representation of the local communities? But also in their conflicting approach, they seek out the solutions to our global crises and the very systems that caused our global crises. Rooted in development, and all the history and weight and reality of that word. So then what is the identity of development then and now? To many, development is not life, but death. It is necrophilic, an act and a methodology whose life exists because of the harm or death or destruction of others. A methodology that commodifies life from human enslavement and in servitude to nature, natural resource destruction and extraction in order to prey upon it and exploit it. Development is the doctrine of conquest. I, I think someone mentioned, Sophia, you might be at the Vatican right now. Go have a talk with the Pope about the papal bull that is the doctrine of conquest, please. It is imperialism, it is colonialism, it is neo-colonialism as in today. This is colonialism with lipstick on and a new name, right? It is annexation, occupation, indigenous erasure and re-education. It is land grabs. It is profit and development for some at the expense, loss, harm, even destruction of others. Development is not just an act or a methodology. It is a powerful weighted word. And the language of a movement matters and somebody chose this word, chose this approach. And within this identity crisis is also the failure to identify, i.e. the actors, institutions, the economic and governance systems that are responsible for these crises. And this failure to identify makes accountability impossible. And accountability is a foundation of justice, the rule of law, and a sustainable just society to deter and stop harmful behavior and to promote, to promote non-harmful behavior. Without accountability, there is no responsibility, no reconciliation, no repair, no restorative justice. And this takes us back to the, re, I call them redrafters and adopters of the SDGs, the states. Those who control the negotiations, watered down the text, selected the language and methodology, and why would they want to not include concepts or words of accountability and responsibility, historical and today? I mean, we see this today in the climate change negotiations. If any nation begins to talk about the historical emissions of a nation, negotiations stop. They are not on the table. You cannot talk about past emissions because who were those that created such vast amounts of past emissions. The wealthy nations, those who control the, the conversation and the negotiations today. It is those who redrafted, signed and adopted the text that caused the very harms that are called for a sustainable approach. So it was their interests arguably that were being protected. This is why we see pretty words with no action read what I linked, read that resolution, beautiful words, 
But when it's not followed with action, you have a break of trust. You have a break of confidence. You almost have, is this a mockery? Because these are the states, these are so the supposed power holders of international law and of course of domestic law as well. A mockery of the very real issues and the very real local communities that they claim to talk to or represent. A mockery of the truth of these harms. This is why we see a failure to name the actors, industries, methodologies, and systems of harm. It was constructed by the power holders, the polluters, the developers to not succeed. Powerful states succeed where they want to succeed. And yes, even in international law. I, I some, Sometimes I'll pick up an international business transactions course to teach. They're succeeding fine in the trade and development world, in foreign direct investment. For some reason, they always seem to work out the laws around that. But with human rights, with the environment, it's failure after failure. But with every movement, predation, exploitation, commodification, a counter movement is growing, is born and growing. And look at the language of the counter movement. It is not of neoliberal economics. It is the rights of future generations, the fights for equality and existence or existence, social and cultural justice. It is critiques of power, of capitalism, of colonialism. It is calls for restorative justice for the, for the legitimacy of indigenous law and without the need for a Westerner to say it's legitimate, right? It is explicit calls for intentional anti-racism, anti-sexism, and decoloniality. It is calls for inclusion. It is a plea to see and to never separate again issues of governance, democracy, authoritarianism from their resulting harms to life. And there is hope with the SDGs. <laughs> they continue to be informed, evolve with the annual dialogues. We have one coming up in April. Uh, and they're going to talk about, I mean, ecological economics was last year and it's continuing into this year as well. Uh, and they're gonna talk about the possibility of an earth assembly that, that would be informed by efforts in ecological law, governance, economics, philosophy, sociology, to create its own epistemology of what it means to live and act in harmony with nature. Now, moving into the chapter itself, I then unpack how the state of the SDGs is a reflection of the state of the system, of our governance systems. We look at human crises that go unanswered, at nature's crises that go unanswered, and see how they are intimately connected, that they are all a result of policy decisions of actions and inactions, and in law, inactions are actions <laughs> of, of those in power. Poverty is the result of policy. Climate change is the result of policy. The result of policies embedded in certain governance and economic ideologies. So ultimately, we are looking at is the protection and furthering and flourishing of life at odds with our current governance structure? Does, does our current way we organize ourselves support life? Does it? Is law an avenue to justice or a barricade of injustice? Here I identify the failure of environmental law explicitly, the sectoral nature of it at direct odds with the science and the ethics of interdependence and the relations necessary for life, and the understanding that the systems and the covenants, I love Stephen that you talked about covenants, the covenants that constrain us are what sustain us. I, I also think it's important to look at who is drafting and implementing or not drafting and not implementing law and policy. In international law, the state is the power holder. That's what we're told, that's what I teach. Uh, they determine what succeeds or what fails. Well, the powerful ones do, right? But are they the actual power holders with weak campaign finance laws, dark money, corruption? The consequences of a profit-driven, hyper-competitive, hyper-individual 
economic system are large corporations and the wealthy, those who lobby and indeed draft the laws and policies. And as a lowly intern, several, two decades ago, I worked on Capitol Hill and it was the lobbyists who draft the laws. Are they not the actual power holders? Which begs the questions, are states fettered to unfettered capitalism? Are states themselves impotent before greed and ego? Sustainable development cannot exist within a ruling economic system that is in concept and practice predatory, where profit is measured by the loss of others, where growth is limitless, and where success is defined by those in power who use destruction, dehumanization, indignity, and inequality to gain that power. The last major section of the chapter looks at whether the SDGs confront, reject, or embrace these root causes of our crises. Do they speak the language of life or of death, of dignity or of commodification? The principle of sustainable development has been well developed in international law, but I think it is important to note the other principles of international law that it implicates. We have a duty not to harm, a duty to protect, the principle of precaution, the principle of sustainability, without development, just sustainability, the right to a healthy environment, the rights of future generations, of nature, even of a stable climate. And although a well-developed principle of international law, this principle of sustainable development, evolved and solidified over 50 years now, the results in practice have violated nearly every principle that it embodies except development. Is this accidental? Can it be? And was it wrong to ever assume a development approach would prioritize anything other than development? Why did we, those who care, welcome it so willingly? And I have written often on the failure of the modern day environmental movement. Development reigns economic and inequitable growth reigns, planetary boundaries are denied and broken, more people, places, and things are made vulnerable, and the most vulnerable are made more vulnerable. Sustainable development has either been so ignored that it has been, become merely a continuation for the disharmony between humans and nature, between humans and the foundations of life on which we depend, or it was never intended to challenge or change those harmful systems. So, impotence or complicity? Philip Ralston, <laughs> I cite him often, he's a former UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, called the development approach to address poverty, or really anything else, a fairy tale. How could we fall for this? Perhaps blinded by hope after decades of disempowerment and devastation? How could we think, one, that the leaders who brought us to this crisis would take us out of it, and two, that the economic system laid, led by development, predation, and exploitation that created these crises would take us out of it. At best, gross negligence by political leaders, or at least the politically powerful, because again, they dictate the negotiations. At worst, it was a betrayal a known failure that they advanced and continue to advance as a solution. I just have two more minutes and I'm done, I promise. It is important to note that in seeing the power and potential of the SDGs, we must look at what they say, like with development, but also what they do not say, i.e. who or what has caused these crises. Some of the bad actors or bad systems can be assumed due, the, due to the language of the goals and targets. For example, calls to raise women up, ensure full and effective participation, address maternal mortality, leads one to ask, well, who or what is blocking or challenging their rise, <laughs> right? Indeed, who's pushing them down? Who or what is denying them a seat at the table? Who or what is responsible for the systems that are killing them? And then one can simply look to the power holders 
and the decision makers as the culprits. And it is the same with several other goals. For example, when looking at the language on forced labor, human trafficking and slavery, who or what is doing this and for what purpose and who is causing or allowing this? Who or what is causing unsafe and secure work environments? Who or what is destroying culture so much that the global community must now unite to try to save it? What economic and governance systems have created the poverty that we must now address? Why does Africa or women or minorities or refugees in particular need attention? What is the history of their harms that have made them vulnerable? Who made them vulnerable? Who made the vulnerable vulnerable? Who made developing nations developing? We must look to who allows these harms, legalizes these harms, profits from these harms, who creates and upholds these systems that create these harms, and so how to move forward. We must see the SDGs as more than color blocks, although those are great for education. I'm not saying that the little beautiful symbols and colors and numbers are not, are not useful, but they're so much more than that. We must see the SDGs as a living, evolving, willing to learn and be better mandate of action for life, for equality, and through justice. In practice, it must be civil society based and supported because we know it is only in theory that is based and supported by those labels as their representatives. It must directly confront power imbalances in the future negotiation of its language and methodology, and as a matter of upholding just forms of law and governance. A justice approach can help ID the harmful actors, systems, and behaviors so that they can be intentionally and directly targeted or, and or held to account. And a justice approach helps us, understand, helps us stand for the responsibility for truth, transparency, equity, and equality. And within a justice approach, is also a direct counter to a purely Western jurisprudential approach, the systemic embedded racism, sexism, and religion, the hierarchies that feminist approaches counter, the re relationality and consequentiality of all in the cosmos that many indigenous approaches counter. So we need to ask ourselves, are we going to continue to be part of a movement that is by evidence of the crises before us, impotent or complicit? Or is it beyond time, beyond 2030, to use the language of the UN, to defend our language of life and relations and truth and justice and dignity and covenants and have the courage to confront the systems that seek to not only cause our destruction, but multiply it. So thank you, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, so I'm uh, scrolling back through the um, uh, I'm scrolling back through right from the very beginning. And we have a really interesting spread of people here. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting that I would categorize there's three types of people on this call. Um, firstly, the ones that aren't familiar with the SDGs. Then we kind of have the ones who really know about the SDGs and then the ones who know about the SDGs and are really frustrated. Um, so uh, I'm going to um, queue up the according and uh, for people that want to join the conversation, uh, please leave your um, messages on, um, on the chat. I'm going to go through that order. Um, the first question originally uh, came about uh, Larsh, which was, uh, let me scroll back up there. Um, it was Sean Patrick. Um, and so I think Sean Patrick had, had left a message and uh, about Larsh, and probably that'll mean that Stephen will respond to it. Um, after that, I think David Hawk had some questions and comments, and he'll go to um, uh, Katie, um, Katie Kish. So let's try those in those order. So um, Sean, Sean Patrick, do you want to try, uh, you would like to speak up on mute? Yeah, I'll unmute, but I didn't actually mean that as a a direct question, but it sounded like what I forget who the speaker was at the time was familiar similar to large communities, like the Jean Vanier concept of uh, bringing people into communities. And I'm not sure if the Waterloo, what was his name, 
Stephen. Uh, Stephen. Yeah. 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 Well, so so it's, uh, it's good for the conversation. So what? So if you could, for those who are yeah. not familiar with the yeah. idea, please describe it, and then we'll have Steve respond. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, large communities was an idea by Jean Vanier, who's a, a Canadian, a little controversial right now. I won't go into why, <laughs> um, but who had you know developed the idea of uh, communities where people with uh, uh, mental disabilities kind of live in community and it's like nonprofit, et cetera, et cetera. And it just reminded me when you were talking, Stephen. Yeah, no, they, they are, they are, it is similar. I think the difference is, and it's a difference between kind of like over the last 150 years, starting with Fourier and all, all, there, there've been all kinds of experiments, with, certainly from the left and sort of romantic utopian socialists with, with intentional communities of various kinds. And they generally fail after one generation. And they generally fail because of the tension between people who are coming in it um, as kind of liberal, autonomous, sovereign individuals, but are committing to something which is inherently communitarian and covenantal and place bound. And um, without the underlay of kinship, um, which is what drives all of those communities for the last 10,000 years, um, it, 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 tends to, it tends to break apart. So I, th I think the difference is that the, 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 the example with Giel is that there's an existing family structure. It's just leverage on, leveraging on an existing family structure. And then the ontology of a kind of Catholic, um, you know, ch charity and communality and, 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 and sort of, you know, a covenant of reciprocity and, um, you know, with, with God and, and, and all the rest of it. So, um, the, the, I, I think the com the comparison is quite instructive because I think one of the difficulties is that the kind of the the, um, the left green version of this tends to assume that you can without even considering it that you can reconcile this this kind of highly individualized psyche which emerges on the back of kind of modern cultures with a with a communitarian kind of pre modern uh, way of being and I and I just just to end, um, well, an aside to that, um, Tolstoy was Orthodox Christian. Um, Gandhi was Hindu. So his Swadeshi, that version of community development, which was very much kind of an antecedent to appropriate technology and uh, community village-led village, village -led development, was framed within the kind of, uh, within the religious frame. E.F. Schumacher, although you would never know this if you went onto the the E.F. Schumacher site or the, the in England or whatever, he was a Catholic and he um, converted five years before um, he or six years before he published um, Small is Beautiful. So that book, which which totally drove Kenneth Boulding was a a, a, a a convinced Quaker. So the the family and the kind of ontological framework is is very difficult to avoid, and I think for secularists coming into it. They're carrying through a kind of an enlightenment rationalism, which doesn't sit easy with with that form of um, communitarian togetherness. And um, so it's similar. But I, yes, I think the comparison of it is instructive. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Good, thanks. Um, so I'm going to have David Hawk uh, probably bring up Rogan with uh, uh, Katie, and then uh, Anna had some comments, and she'll probably end up talking to Sophie. So David Hawk. Oh, David Hawk, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, very nice to be here. Uh, nice to meet all of you who I do not know, uh, except for two or three. Uh, I've been involved in the uh, uh, climate change arena, I guess, since 1975. Um, did a major research project at the Stockholm School of Economics from 75 to 77, which involved 20 major companies and six governments. And the companies involved were the major oil and chemical companies of the world. And so what we did is measure 
how successful their facilities were, depending on the government that was trying to regulate them. So that's why we had six governments with different approaches to environmental, shall we say, abuse, deterioration, pollution, climate change, whatever you want to call it. And that study uh, uh, came up with some interesting results, which uh, at least two of the CEOs of oil companies, meaning Exxon and Texaco, took it to heart and gave lectures on climate change before they were fired by their boards and replaced by genuine men from Texas, which of course put them back on the right track. Anyway, uh, that particular study did look into the role of law, the people that write the law and the people that uh, try to interpret the law. And we found particularly the US approach to the law was pitiful, if not outrageously bad. And I interviewed the senators that wrote the law back then, uh, Muskie, et cetera, et cetera. Interviewed their aides, of course, and then put together uh, many cases that were demonstrated using that law. And in essence, finally, we took the study down to two countries, the US and Sweden. And we compared the US and Sweden on their laws and just to give you a footnote, which David has heard before, uh, the US laws consume tens of thousands of pages, which were essentially incoherent, filled with hundred word sentences, where they concluded with the opposite of what they started with, and in between was rabble. And it was done intentionally, by the way. I talked to the people that wrote them, that they meant to do that because they didn't know what they were doing. Whereas the Swedish laws, all environmental laws were contained by 25 pages. And so the minister in charge of the law, when a presentation was given to OECD of this work, along with the prime minister of Sweden, he pointed out that we Swedes are funny. We're not like Americans. In Sweden, we believe in order to obey the law, you must first understand it. Of course, in America, you don't believe that. And then he went into details. Nonetheless, I have a concern about the training of US lawyers and then how that's carried out relative to environmental law. And so uh, having been working in the area since the 70s, and I do have six, soon we'll have seven books in the area which uh, deal with this. <laughs> I can't tell you the titles of two of them because uh, of a word that's in the title. And uh, Amazon has restricted that book to candles. And so then uh, I complimented the manager of Amazon on how at least if you have this book in candles and you get pissed off, you can burn it because you'll have a candle right next to you. So then they moved it to t-shirts with dirty words on them. So now you can find the book in t-shirts with dirty words. Anyway, a new manager at Amazon has since come back to me and asked me to please edit that because they said it sells really well and people somehow find the damn thing. And so we would like to have it amongst books, but would you please change the title? David, uh, to the point, please. And that is the point. <laughs> okay. Um, but I'd, I'd like to have, I'd, until, I'd like to, until I'd, it's too late, David. Humans are pretty hopeless on climate change, regardless of the law. Um, Katie, would you like to respond to that? Um, is the other Katie? Is that no, uh, Katie, Katie Kish? Katie okay. Kish. <laughs> Oh, I really, I thought that was all for other Katie. <laughs> I mean, I don't have much to say on how American law is writing down some such potential responses. So oh, yes, okay. uh, yes, it, everything you said, yes. The failure of so much of the law is the U.S., well, and the, the global influence of, of the U.S., is a failure of the legal system in the United States and our approach, not only to the training and education of future lawyers, the jurist doctorate approach, which is a practice approach uh, versus a PhD approach, which is what the majority of other international lawyers 
uh, that's their path towards legal thinking development. It's, it's so much more holistic, encompassing. You learn the roots of justice. You know, I don't, you don't even have to take that class if they offer it in US law schools. Um, so it's really like train to the bar and how to train for the bar exam and then how to represent a client. And the, you know, the follow of the law, the, the, the law follows that training. It's very sectoral, like I said, um, with specifically with the environment. Remember many of the US environmental laws were founded in the commerce clause. So it wasn't even from a position of care. It was your pollution is coming over into my state. You know, it was cross, it was cross boundary pollution issues and commerce. And, and so that's kind of the origin story there. And then you have issue, you have procedural hurdles of standing. That's why you have the Christopher Stone should trees have, have rights and standing. Um, you, you know, you, so you see all these kind of counter movements to try to address this frustration that our environmental laws are not protecting the environment. But my concern is that it's such a multi-pronged issue. So you have the, the law school issue, you know, of how we're teaching future lawyers and future lawmakers, because most of everybody on Capitol Hill is a lawyer as well, a, G, a US trained lawyer. Um, but you also have the issue of the practice itself. So they come out of law school, how are they practicing? Uh, can they argue for standing? Where's the burden of proof? With environmental law, it's always causation. There's too many causal links that don't connect. You know, so they have all these hurdles that just don't make sense when the harm is in front of you. You know, so you have to over, it's not on the side of those who, have been, who, have been, who are being harmed. Then you have the legislative hurdles, like the laws themselves and when how they're drafted and their purpose. And then you have our Supreme Court. And I'm incredibly concerned for anyone who follows, and thank you if you don't, but West Virginia, the EPA, that gutted the regulatory powers of the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate emissions, GHG. So they are powerless when it comes to climate change. So it's a multi-pronged issue um, that starts with, like you said, the, the way that the, the students are trained. I, for my little part, tried to expose them to um, new thinking and, and new approaches, but I'm only one person. But no, we've, we've got a lot of issues in front of us. Thanks, David. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to invite um, Anna to uh, speak to Sophie about the conference um, because it was unusual. And after that, uh, Badra was participating in a uh, hackathon that may be interest to uh, Katie. So uh, Anna, would you like to speak? I'm Anna. Are you talking about me? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Anna. Anna oh. Checkman. Uh, yes. Hello. No, I, I was actually uh, talking about the conference. Just um, I, I had some thoughts on. Uh, sorry, which conference? I'm so confused. Sorry. Sorry. I'm, I'm actually working through sequentially. If you want to bring up another question, that's fine. Go ahead. Oh, um, well, no. I mean, you know, it's, it, I think, you know, the kind of what I could read between the lines and some of the conversations, right, is, uh, you know, we need like ideas and, you know, a, a sort of logical, um, a logical progression to like maybe ideology, right? And, um, you know, kind of like the central um, theme of my life is the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, that I inherited from my family who um, were the anti-Soviet uh, citizens of the Soviet Union, you know, my grandparents, my parents, uh, you know, they just didn't fit into that system, but the system was so ideologically uncompromising um, that, um, you know, their point, there was no room for alternative points of view. And uh, then uh, that system, uh, collapsed and all of a sudden uh, alternative points of view just you know sprang up from nowhere but actually they existed you know throughout the the, the whole um, the whole time Soviet Union was around so um, you know what I learned from just like the history of my family and um, you know people like that is that uh, you know if if we just 
you know, if we just say this is the right thing to do and this is the wrong thing to do, you know, and, you know, um, if we do this um, uh, or like, you know, if we continue with uh, uh, the, the interests that exist right now, um, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we, we can't, sorry, I'm not a speaker, but anyway, so what, you know, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, when we try to like, uh, not consider, um, different points of view who say, okay, maybe this was a good idea at the time, uh, when we decided to, I don't know, extract uh, fossil fuels and, uh, you know, just consume, 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 um, then they, I don't, think they disappear they kind of like go underground so if we overdo it with um you know imposing our visions be it the um sdgs or anything else on uh people who are not ready for them um they're i don't think they're going to change their mind i think maybe um if we don't incorporate these points of view then you know when this, the new system that we create is at its weakest, you know, they're kind of going to strike strike back. So um, this is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. So if um, there are comments that would um, help me resolve you know, my worry about the future in these terms, I would appreciate this. Uh, so, sorry, I- Okay, um, I so <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I'll, 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 I, I'm going to ask Sophie if she wants to respond. If she doesn't, she could hand it off to someone else. Uh, Sophia? Sure, I'm happy to provide a little bit of a response there. There's something that uh, came across my uh, social media today, um, which is a quote from the late David Graeber. And he says that the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just as easily make differently. And so I think gen generally in response to Anna's statements here is just that um, any sort of beginning or cultivation of some kind of alternative uh, is a radical act and is an act that begins that shift and creates that momentum of change. And if we all stick to sort of the rat race structure and behave accordingly, nothing will ever change. But it takes those few brave souls. And you had said, a little bit before about sort of the uncompromising nature of, of the system. And I would definitely use that word for academia as someone who's fresh out of the academy and seven years of grad school, I will um, happily testify to the, to the scenes, the tra tragic scenes of myself and my many colleagues who struggle through this system very much because we're raised in this society where we require change and we require radical ideas and the academy is not interested in these ideas and the the juxtaposition there is just fascinating um so i would just encourage anyone and everyone to participate in something radical and alternative and we saw a lot of that actually during the pandemic um that's something that my my personal research was in which is not in this chapter at all but i can dive into it a little bit here and just looking at what are those kinds of signals that people do want something different. During the pandemic, people realized that why are we wasting all of this time and really actually enjoying these intimate dinners with our family and with our friends and building these more solid connections and networks that we didn't realize were so valuable before. So I think, again, in just building these alternatives one step at a time, we can really create that, that momentum for change. I hope that addresses some of that question. And I'm just gonna, I, I have to run, but I do just wanna say, you know, Sophie's saying, doing something radical and something, an alternative, um, that doesn't have to be as radical and alternative as it sounds. My radical and alternative is working part-time, uh, dropping out of the academic run, becoming, a, well, putting motherhood on the front burner, um, gardening, joining the community center board of directors. Uh, it can look really, um, it can be really simple things that make a really big difference. And I think that's the whole point of this book is that small changes can cascade into big effects. Um, so I, I appreciate everyone's comments and this space and uh, I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks Katie.
Katie has to run. We're going to continue on the conversation. Uh, Badra uh, uh, was participating in a hackathon. Would you like to talk about that, Badra, and uh, how it might build community? Yeah, sure, David. Um, thank you, and thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, actually, there is not much to share about that. Um, first of all, I'm mainly here to learn and, and actually listen more than say something. Uh, maybe I can just share quickly some impressions I had, like some positive and some less positive. Uh, definitely, I agree with what Giri said about the uh, hackathons, and they are actually full of energy and full of hope. And hopefully, uh, like some spark may actually come out of that and make make some change. However, on which is which was true, like seeing actually the the, the amount of, of 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 passion and and and, and true concern and also creative ideas and, and, and brainstorming sessions. That was um, refreshing, if I can say that. Uh, especially that the majority, like there were like some professionals and, and, and like a bit uh, like, um, what I can say, like a bit older, if I can say that, like I consider myself, but the majority were actually like either like students or, or still fresh grads. So it was refreshing to see that level of awareness and concern. Having said that, the, the less positive part was actually similar to what has been shared throughout the whole session today. Like how effective those efforts and also whether they are, as I was saying, like again, I'm, I'm not as articulate as many of you here, like, but I was calling it as the, like the painkiller pill and that actually generates just an illusion of, of, of taking an action or an illusion of uh, solving the problem. And uh, to your point, um, Giddy, like uh, the fact that it, I agree with you, like digging deeper, like behind even some of the goals themselves and maybe some of the language itself. It reminded me of that story I came across when there, I don't remember, it was maybe like in the 80s or something like that, sharing like the Congress were discussing uh, allocating a budget of $10 million, 10 million, not billion, $10 million to be able to solve uh, or to cover like. 50% of the US children. And I was like, and then the commentary was like, and the whole debate for weeks and months was about uh, which province, sorry, which, uh, which state will, like which budget this will be taken off and stuff like that. And it was funny because the commenter was saying that if it takes $10 million to cover 50%, why don't we spend 20 million and then cover 100% of that? So it's that thing, you know, like you feel like there is a bone that is being thrown into the, to the crowd so that we get busy with something we feel that we're doing something and again i don't want to get pessimistic like still it's good it's good that there is at least some triggering or, or some sparks as i as i said but um yeah maybe long story short like similar to many of the comments in the chat like I'm, I'm, i keep thinking of okay what then i myself i'm repeating the same mistake like keep repeating those concerns or or, or venting but what actually the effective action that we can take can, what can we do uh, individually so that we can start something and also collectively and, and holistically so maybe that's the question that's the burning question now yeah thank, thank, thanks Badra. i'm i'm really unfortunate that katie had to leave so i'm actually going to punt to steven um, and ask if he would handle that um, after that, I'm uh, Randy had actually had some comments, and so I'm trying to figure out who to do that to. But to Stephen, would you like to respond uh, to the optimism and pessimism that Badra's talking about? I don't know. I, I don't know if I can talk directly to that, but I, I have a general comment about. Um, I think I'm probably on the other side of the fence to um, Katie with the Y and 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 Sophie, in the sense that the the default situation of human beings for the last 10,000 years has been grinding poverty. That's the default situation. That's the first thing. So whatever you think about capitalist modernization or colonialism, or blah, 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 even the last 30 or 40 years, hundreds of millions of people have been bought out of, uh, of, of, of poverty. Uh, people in China are much better off materially in ways that we shouldn't dismiss than they were under Mao, right? Uh, uh, with the, you know, the iron rice bowl and all the rest of it. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that all of these concepts that you're using, which, which turn on rights, individual rights came from, I can, it, I, yeah, Deuteronomy to uh, 24, 25, um, 
uh, in the Torah is the first time that someone in a tribal society says you shouldn't be accountable for the sins of your father or the sins of your mother or the sins of your daughter or the sins of your 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 son that you're an individual that that idea was incomprehensible in any tribal society viking ojibwe it doesn't matter chinese doesn't matter it, it, it was a revolutionary idea and and all of our ideas of whatever criticizing jurisprudence i mean i get it but all of those ideas that you're using human rights come from the imago day translated through the enlightenment and spread around the world paradoxically and discomfortingly through colonialism and, and all the rest of it so um which isn't a it's not about justification it's just an observation and um if um the, the difficulty is that the levels of complexity that we're taking for granted and, and you're absolutely taking for granted when, when that climate conference in 2019 uh, i think we started off with a conversation about pronouns but but the african bishops the anglican have are about to go out of communion with the, with the, the anglican communion with with the um with the uh, with the church of england uh, i mean not not that i care but, but because of a profound uh disagreement about you know uh western hyper individualized uh hyper free hyper liberal gender sexuality politics which comes before absolutely everything and norms of of conduct and which are much more familiar which are taken for granted in many parts of the global south so if you start off with a conversation about pronouns you're immediately not having a conversation with 50 percent of canada who immediately dismiss everything that you've got to say and and uh, and all of the global south which also dismisses everything that you've got to say not the not the vocal and rich part of the global south which is on twitter but certainly in in terms of all the villages and 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 uh, and, and and the rest of it so which, which isn't to come down either way on, on on the question of pronouns or isn't to come out it's it's about wicked dilemmas and so i the the, the difficulty about the difficulty about this project of sustainable development goals is trade-offs you have to identify trade-offs if you want a more if you want a more place band like the, the, the someone asked about the lache community if, if uh, there's been so many experiments with 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 communes and and communal societies and and retreating and uh, and the only ones who stick it the only ones who manage it are the mennonites and the hutterites and the, and the amish because they're tied together by an ideology which insulates them and they're actually much more ecological than anybody else not because they care about the environment just because because they're they're you know they, they they do what they do because they believe in God in a certain way and their uh, their Protestantism le le leads them that way. But um, if you uh, if we if we're serious about like if 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 the eco eco modernist thing is right, then we can have this world of complexity. We can just make it green, and then we're good. Then we can have Twitter and TikTok and and uh, sex change operations and and um, the modern dentistry and and uh, otherwise. Every single one of us, every single one of us who uses one of these, which is every single one of us, are buying into cobalt slavery in the Congo right now. There are children dying in the Congo because we're using these. And it's not about, it's not because people in the West chose growth, 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 or consumerism, or, or, or in that kind of moralistic way. It's because in order to solve the class conflicts, which are ripping societies apart in the 1920s and 1930s, they had to come up with a version of modern society which could produce a welfare state and housing and health and, and all of that. And, and the, the, the compromise which was struck was high growth rates, which pay high fiscal taxes, which pay for a welfare state. And all of those growth rates externalize the costs of growth elsewhere. Now, there's many, there's 200 million people in China who, who uh, are, are, you know, as rich or richer than 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 people in Britain or America. There's 200 million Indians, the same. There are people in Indonesia, Malaysia. There's a big middle class in Nairobi. There's a big middle class in uh, in in Lagos. So, uh, and there are people being pulled out of poverty. The the problem is that what's happening underneath in terms of the biosphere is catastrophic. So, and there will be limits to growth, and it will kick in. But I I, I think rather than blaming, rather than kind of 
pointing out all the baddies or the kind of just the te- you know the colonial you know what it, it, it um the the question is what are you what are you willing to sacrifice because feminism came straight out of the enlightenment feminism is is the catholic imago day plus the enlightenment which you see in mary wollstonecroft and and, and uh, the young mary shelley and uh, going right through to Simone de Beauvoir and, and Sheila Firestone and all of those people. That, that you, you, you wouldn't get feminism without the Enlightenment and without capitalist modernization. So if you're coming from a feminist perspective, you're already implicated in everything that we're, we're talking about. So, you know, rather than what are other people doing badly, what are you willing to give up? What constraints are you willing in terms of a covenantal society is one where you don't get choices. Once you're married, you're in covenant, you don't get a choice. My life is about making my wife happy and, and, and sorting out my kids. That's my life. And, and the lack of choice makes me happy because it's joy through constraint. Uh, th- that's, most people's, uh, un- that's most people's experience of having children, that it, it pushes away a lot of crap, horrible decisions, choices, because suddenly you know what, what, what kind of you have to do. So, that's why the familial, communitarian, place-bound things work. But in that kind of society, you don't get to ask, who am I? What can I become? Can I become a space pilot? Should I become the first female leader of a multinational corporation? You know, it, 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 it's all a different set of questions. Sorry. That's, that, uh, that, that's good, and it's tough. <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're running uh, towards the end, and uh, we're losing people. I actually had offered to have Randy uh, give a talk, but he's giving a bath to his child, so he's set his priorities. <laughs> um, and so, right there. And so um, I'm going to take two more. Uh, Jesse had some comments. Um, I'm not sure who to direct them to, and then Donald had some uh, comments as well, if he's still going to hang on. Um, but I think after that, we'll have to close out because uh, we're running out a little bit. Uh, so, Jesse, did you want to make some comments? And who should, who would like to respond? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I didn't hear much uh, uh, thinking about what's wrong with the system that we're trying to correct. Um, uh, and that's what my comments are about. And and uh, uh, it seems to me we the one thing we haven't done is just look at, at all the different kinds of growth systems uh, that nature uses and that we use in our daily work. We, we use a growth system to make dinner, for heaven's sake, as well as to make children and as well as to make organizations. And, uh, and why do they work in some cases and, and not in others uh, uh, to create something that is, that is highly productive and lasts a long time? Or shows no no sense of of uh, self worth or or sur- or survival like the economy. Um, so th- thanks, Jesse. I think I'm actually if I can get Sophie to answer that because she was doing some work on on degrowth. And so um, if Sophie's still available, uh, do you want to comment a little bit on Jesse's question? Yeah, um, absolutely. So thinking about sort of degrowth economics, um, what, uh, sorry, could you, could you repeat the question? So I was just reading well, the, I the did, chat. Uh, I've, I've studied why self-controlled systems are self-controlled uh, for 40 years and found all sorts of interesting stuff. The, the main thing they do is to have a survival instinct. Uh, at causing them to move their growth resources to caring for themselves and their and their environment. So why can't we think of doing that for the world economy? Move our growth resources to caring for uh, our future. Yeah, I think it just comes down to again the sort of ecological. Um, foundations of the planet and the ecological foundations of the economy is at the end of the day is a continually growing economy compatible with um, planetary boundaries and the answer is um, not necessarily and um, I think necessarily not actually yeah absolutely I think this kind of speaks to some of um, Steve's comments as well because I did want to address them before 
we closed down. Um, because I think when, when we think about a lot of the limitations, Steve, that you bring up, um, the bigger conversation, so I would have to say that I disagree a lot with this idea that you can only have this cosmopolitan, you can only have these equity rights, you can only have feminism on top of a capitalist structure or on top of the exploitation and colonization and everything that has happened. That is not, in my opinion, the only pathway to get there. I think you can treat a human being with equity and with respect without standing on a pile of money, in my opinion. And if we look at the outrageous levels of inequality that we face today, Oxfam just came out with a report that this year, 252 men, and I would, I would uh, bargain that they are white males, own more wealth than all women and girls in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean put together. And that is enough for me to say that this is not a system at all that I subscribe to in any way. And I would be more than happy to give up this particular well, system. But it doesn't exist because we subscribe to it. For sure, but we all, we all play it, it's, into it. It's in, it's in control. Yes. Why don't they recognize their own survival? The managers of the system, they're all wonderfully educated, mostly good moms and dads. Why don't they recognize the, the risk to themselves? I think there's just a lot more, I think, a conversation but, that but needs... Sophie, Sophie, listen, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're not all white men. They're, they're, a lot of them are Chinese. And, and China now, whether you like it or not, uh, if you asked people on the ground in China about whether they liked the system where the, which generated these billionaires, however obscene it is, isn't it? And, and to me too, I mean, I'm not interested in billionaires with yachts, um, compared with what they had in the 1960s, they would go with it every time. I mean, the, the, you know, just because, uh, you know, uh, there's only a, a certain amount you can consume. Most of that wealth is kind of invested in various things, doing various jobs. I mean, a billionaire can have so many hookers and so much coke and so much, well, they actually can't have too much coke because otherwise he'll lose all his money. Uh, you know, but, but so, so they, they can consume so much, they can consume like a pharaoh, but the, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sort of, I'm not underestimating the, the level of in, inequality, but, but it, it, it goes with, where you have this kind of equalitarian kind of logic, you end up with something like East Germany or, or um, I mean, none of the socialist experiments have worked, not a single one. I mean, just haven't worked. They, 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 cre they created, invariably created terrible po poverty and normally genocide along with it. Venezuela is a good example. So I, I think the sort of moral objection to kind of wealth. If you want, if you want to change that, you have to have a. It has to be a spiritual kind of framing, an ontological framing where people are, uh, are drawn into that voluntarily. But that doesn't go with the secular society of individuals. That's what's really let people off the hook. If you're a nineteenth-century baron in Russia. There might be a great de degree of hierarchy, or in India, but you had to look after the people who were on your estate. You were you were owed it. What happened with capitalism is that you got they were turned into wage wage laborers. You lost that kind of ontological framework, that shared religion of with, with that covenant that you had to kind of look after people, even if it was unequal, and uh, and the secularism and and um and and actually, I mean. Put it this way, the neoliberals want open labor markets because they want the wages low. Well, so do the left. The, 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 the far left are, are on, and, and, and the neoliberals are on the same side now. They're all secular. They want low wage. They don't want low. The le left wants kind of this version of, I don't know, whatever it is. And, and the neoliberals want low wages. So they're all in favor of open borders. I'm going, to give, uh, I'm going to give Sophie a minute to respond, and then I'm going to uh, have uh, Dawn come on. Uh, Sophie. Yeah, I think, so I'll just kind of put it back out there, um, more philosophical questions to, to chew on. But I think 
conversation about what it is that we are sustaining. I think a lot of the time when we talk, when environmentalists and sustainability advocates have a conversation about this sustainable development alternative, we're making huge assumptions about how we want to sustain present levels of manufacturing, present levels of industry, present levels of energy and material consumption, when in reality, there is going to be a drastic reduction as well as redistribution. So maybe we don't have 27 different new models of cars every single year. Maybe we cut industries out like fashion and technological gadgets that are not really necessary. And we're able to sort of renegotiate where our resources are being um, spent and, and sent. And with regards, Steve, to your comment around sort of family structure, I would just argue that that is a very novel concept in the term of human history we are much more akin to sort of kinship networks and obligations and relationships way beyond just the family narrative. And I think we need to start reconnecting to those larger networks rather than oh, the I, nuclear I family agree. and the household. Yeah, you got, I totally agree with that. Great, thank you. Uh, Donald, would you like to uh, make your comment or, and I'm not sure who to direct your comment to about the poly crisis. And Don's on mute. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, there was a, there's a fascinating article. I saw them produce the Atlas of Impunity uh, on, a, on a show on Sunday, I believe. And um, this is shocking. And, and it, it's reached a, a level that we haven't seen in a bloody long time. And, and often in the past, it was a matter of omission. Now it's a matter of deliberate deliberate release from responsibility of the powers that be. And around the world today, there are people getting away literally with murder and many, many, many other crimes. And there's no way of calling them to account, either nationally, locally, or internationally. And they've set it up that way. And the fact that they have so much power and so much wealth uh, means that they can uh, get a lot of people in power besides themselves to turn the other way right this is a very dangerous situation the answers to a lot of these problems uh, sounds glib it's uh, well we need more communications and more general education not the kind of stuffy ivory tower stuff that is incomprehensible and comes in such large chunks that nobody has time to read um and i see some signs of that but uh, there's a long way to go and uh, yeah, the other comment I made, I guess, was uh, somebody referred to uh, to David um, Grebner and also um, his his colleague Webner, who wrote the book The Dawn of Everything. And uh, it's a little bit Pollyanna in some ways, a little bit disorganized because Gre Grebner was dying at the time. And uh, but on the other hand, if you go back thousands of years, you find just about every experiment that you can imagine in social organization was tried. And often it was back and forth, back and forth. Hunters and gatherers became farmers. Farmers became hunters and gatherers, depending on the circumstances. But we are so rigid now and so formulaic and so bedogged by, you know, by policy and by ideology and everything else that we can't seem to, to have that kind of flexibility anymore. And there's a kind of creeping pessimism that comes up from behind and grabs us by the neck. Anyway, <laughs> that's simplifying it grossly, but it's out there. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Um, so okay. KD, KDG hasn't spoken um, in a while, so I wondered if she'd like to have the last word uh, before we close out. That's, that's quite a task of the last word. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've been absorbing, of course, at what everyone has been saying and taking it all to heart. And, and some things I strongly agree with and some things I strongly disagree with. Uh, but it's important to have these spaces for these conversations, of course. I, I will say in my work, you know, just to continue a little bit to end with the book <laughs> and what we're doing forward with the SDGs and just global governance and is it even capable of addressing global crises, whether it's climate change or whether it's Ukraine, whether it's, it's the violation of territorial integrity 
uh, in Ukraine? You know, can global governance, can states come together to do this? And of course, all the crises in addition to Ukraine and before Ukraine, the genocides, the wars, the civil wars, the child soldiers, you know, can global governance respond to any of this? And, you know, that, that comes with solutions that have to happen at the state, but the, even state governance, I talk a little bit about our political representatives don't represent us anymore because of the influences of dark money and, and the lobbyists. And it's just so manipulated and heavy and it's easy to get pessimistic. But I, as I mentioned in the thread, um, I think identifying things as they are, that is de denialism, that is disinformation. Um, it could also be empowering, you know, because if once we identify it, then we can think together on how to tackle it. Um, but for me, one of my major um, issues or points of concern with my own work is when I see people and colleagues and al people you assume would be allies for the cause of nature, for the cause, cause of feminism, which is equality. <laughs> That's what feminism is equality for human rights, collective rights, community rights. That's for dignity, you know? Um, it, it's when they start to pick up the language of the systems that harm, when they start to call a forest a carbon sink, when they start to say, we need to put a, a price on a whale, like literally one of my colleagues is on a panel with someone who's like, we need to have the dollars and cents of a whale. That's what makes me nervous. And that's where I see like we're going down a not good path because that's the path that brought us here. And so when I see again, people who, who have the label as environmentalists or people who care and sustainable and future in life um, start to adopt the, the language and methodology of the systems of harm, that's when I start to lose hope. It's like when within your own community of care, do you know what I'm saying? So I think part of our responsibility is to identify that. And I don't think people are always bad intentioned when they do that, um, but I think they need to know the repercussions of carbon trading, of carbon markets, of carbon sinks, instead of the language of the power of an environmental movement, life, you know, like life. Um, I, and, and so that's where I feel we gotta do better on. So that's all, that's where I'll end. I, I like closing on life. <laughs> that, that, I'm definitely uh, happy with that. Um, so thanks everyone for participating. Um, there's more comments that we than we could actually cover uh, today. Um, and so uh, uh, I, I've seen some email addresses going by. If people don't know how to contact people, you can always email me and I'll get you in contact. Uh, the next session for System Thinking Ontario is going to be on April 17th. Uh, Zad is taking a leadership role in that one, and it may be controversial, uh, so we'll see what happens. We'll keep everyone informed. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.